The Community Solution is an organization exploring the peak oil crisis. Its focus is on local community-based solutions that reflect the values of cooperation, conservation, and curtailment. The breakup of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s created a major economic crisis in Cuba known as the Special Period. So we have from 1989 to 1993 a free fall of the economy to of 34% of GDP, gross domestic product. When I tell you free fall of the economy, trying to imagine an airplane suddenly lose their engines. It was really a crash. Cuba lost 80% of its export and import markets. Oil imports dropped by more than half. Buses stopped running, factories closed, electricity blackouts were common, and food was scarce. People almost starved. In reality, when this all began, it was a necessity. People had to start cultivating vegetables wherever they could. Over the next decade, Cuba took drastic steps to find solutions. It is the first country to face the crisis that we will all face the peak oil crisis. Two years ago, we learned about a concept called peak oil, in which we have, will find that oil production is sort of reaching a peak sometime in the next few years and will be going down, and that implies basically a major change in our way of life. And what we've discovered is that Cuba, because their own artificial peak oil was imposed on them when the Soviet Union collapsed is actually a model for what's going to take place in the rest of the world. So we wanted to see if we can capture what is it in the Cuban people and the Cuban culture that allowed to go, uh, go through this very difficult time without competing over scarce resources. And we think Cuba has a lot to show the world about how to deal with energy adversity, which I think we'll all be facing. In 1949, oil geologist Dr. M. King Hubbard developed the theory of oil depletion, making the prediction that the fossil fuel era would be very short. In 1956, he forecasted that American oil production in the continental 48 states would reach peak production in 1970. Production did peak that year, as he predicted. In 1974, Hubbard testified to a Senate subcommittee warning of the dangers of declining fossil fuels in an exponential growth culture. The U.S. oil peak in 1970, combined with a crisis in the Middle East, led to severe oil shortages and an economic crisis in the country. Americans experienced record high interest rates, long gas lines, the highest gasoline prices in history, recession, and a declining stock market. Government films were produced explaining the problem. We were caught by surprise with a crisis that could recur and recur unless the entire country recognized the dangers of a quite real energy shortage. Our industrial progress and economic growth was fired by what many seemed to look on as endless energy. But warning signs were there. I think it's going to end with everybody changing their, their habits. During this time, gas purchases were restricted to every other day, long gas lines appeared, and the speed limit was lowered. President Carter formed a task force, which in 1980 published the Global 2000 Report to the President. The report pointed out that by the year 2000, half of all the oil available in the world would have been consumed. Carter had begun a new energy policy. Tax credits were offered for alternative energy, and wind turbines began to appear on the landscape. But then Alaska's Prudhoe Bay and the oil fields of the North Sea came online. The oil crisis eased and prices dropped. Carter's call for frugality and care was rejected. Ronald Reagan moved into the White House and dramatically cut research and development for alternative energy. 
It was morning in America again, and the country went to sleep for a generation. But the problem didn't go away, as oil consumption continued to increase year after year. In 1997, petroleum geologist Dr. Colin Campbell wrote The Coming Oil Crisis. Three years later, he founded the Association for the Study of Peak Oil, known as ASPO, and held the first meeting on peak oil in Sweden in 2002. Dr. Ken DeFay, a Princeton oil geologist, published Hubbard's Peak in 2001, followed two years later by Richard Heinberg's seminal work, The Party's Over. In 2005, Matt Simmons' book, Twilight in the Desert, challenged the stated oil reserves of Saudi Arabia. A flood of books and magazines began to appear on the market. 25 books were published in 2004 and 2005, and hundreds of articles in newspapers and magazines. The long sleep of the 80s and 90s is coming to an end. And with no more preparation than in 1970, global peak oil is arriving. Peak oil is the point in time when oil production reaches its maximum. And that doesn't mean that we're running out. What it means is that we're going to have a continuous decline in production from that point. Peak oil occurs when a reservoir is ab about half empty. Reservoir pressure drops to the halfway point and so less and less oil will be extracted each year. World oil production grew slowly until the 1950s, then accelerated until the late 1970s, dipped for a few years because of the Mideast crisis, and then began increasing again. In a few years, we'll hit the ultimate peak when half the world's oil will be gone. Oil production will begin to decline. At the same time, world oil demand will continue to grow and world population is increasing along with it. What peaks is not total oil, it's the easy oil to produce. What's left is the less desirable oil that you couldn't get out in the first place very fast. It takes more energy to produce, and a far smaller quantity comes from each well. Oil is finite, natural gas is finite, coal, uranium, all these are finite fuels. So there's going to be a peak for all of these, and peak oil is just the beginning. The effect on our culture could be extreme. Our economy and our way of life are based on consuming oil and other fossil fuels. Each person in the U.S. consumes the yearly per capita equivalent of 10 barrels of oil for food, 9 barrels of oil for automobiles, and 7 barrels of oil for their homes. The major use of fossil fuels is for food production. What peak oil means is essentially a limited supply. World oil discovery peaked in the mid-1960s and has been declining ever since. Right now, we're consuming about five barrels of oil for every one that we discover. That is an unsustainable amount and can't be continued much longer. But at the same time, we have increasing demand throughout the world, especially in developing countries like China. Now, in 1993, China had 733,000 cars on the road, and by the start of 2004, they had six million cars. By the end of 2004, they had 8 million cars. They've convinced people that it's nice to drive. Well, the whole vision for these developing countries is that they're going to be like America someday, and that the people are going to be able to consume the way that Americans have consumed. But that's not going to be able to happen. And that's not even possible for America. Americans won't be able to consume like Americans today. Peak oil is unprecedented. We've never become dependent on fossil fuels before in human history, and we've never experienced a peak in fossil fuel production. So we, we're flying blind as, as a global community. And so we need examples. We need some sort of uh, laboratory experiment where we can run this and see you know, what's the best way to do it, what's, what's not so good, and so on. And Cuba provides us with that because Cuba has already undergone a kind of energy famine.
after the Soviet Union, oil import dropped from 13, 14 million tons a year to only four. Cuba in the 80s had 90,000 Russian tractors, factories of, of pesticides and chemical fertilizers you, we received from the Soviet Union. In 1990, everything changed. There was nothing. When the deep economic crisis began in the 19, early 1990s, it was a change in our lifestyle. We all of a sudden saw abruptly in a matter of weeks, time, you know, a huge change. We saw uh, symptoms of malnutrition in children under five years of age. We saw pregnant women with anemia. We had underweight babies at birth. The impact on food scarcity was disastrous. The average Cuban lost 20 pounds by 1994. We were desperate for everything. We don't care about first world quality standards on any commodity. We just need food. It doesn't matter what you bring, we will buy it. Without imported fuel oil, it was impossible for Cuba to generate the electricity it needed, resulting in blackouts throughout the country. Well, we had, at that time, uh, power cuts that lasted for many, many hours, maybe up to 14, 16 hours a day. And this, in, in a climate such as ours, is very difficult because uh, you do need the fridge so the spool won't, won't uh, spoil. So you had to cook on a daily basis what, what you had to eat at that moment because you just couldn't put things away. And it was a very difficult moment. Power cuts were particularly hard in Cuba's large housing complexes. In a tropical climate, with its heat and humidity, it was difficult to be without the use of air conditioners and fans. Without elevators, people used the stairs. Water was carried up or hauled up the outside of the building using a pulley and rope. When taking a bus, people had to wait three to four hours. When the bus arrived at work, often there was no power. Even if there was power, sometimes there were no spare parts or raw materials. So even if they got to work and had electricity, there was nothing to do. After work, they'd have to wait another three to four hours for a bus, and often when the bus arrived, it was full, and they'd have to wait for another one. The government imported 1.2 million bicycles from China and manufactured half a million more. We had to then uh, learn how to use bicycles, and bicycles were distributed all around the country to try to get to our workplaces. Doctors went to the hospitals, you know, on bikes, without any culture of using bikes. It was just political will, that was it. There's no other way. In 1992, the United States tightened its embargo on Cuba. Any ship that docked in a Cuban port was denied access to the U.S. for six months afterwards. Almost overnight, $750 million worth of food and medical supplies to Cuba were halted. A few years later, the embargo was intensified, and foreign businesses working in Cuba were barred from entering the U.S. Cuba's access to foreign capital was crippled. In the case of Cuba, you try to suffocate a country. You deprive the country of access to uh, financial sources, so Cuba cannot have access to the World Bank or to the IMF for good. An American dollar reached 150 pesos. And, and, and the average salary is, is like two pesos, no? There were people that were making two bucks a month. So money was not useful to, to get stuff. So we end up being like an experiment, no? Like with control conditions. Like nothing or very little things can get from the outside, so everything has to happen from the inside. During the first five years of the special period, government food rations kept the crisis at bay. These food distributions guaranteed a minimum level of food to each of Cuba's citizens. And it was invented when we lost diplomatic relations with the U.S., no more economic relations with the U.S., and in order to prevent hoarding, okay, so the more people have more money, we just swipe, just do away with everything on the counters, and others would go hungry. They invented this ration food distribution system. With food imports reduced by 80%, the government supplied food distributions had to be cut drastically. You have the official state market through subsidies, ration card, which has been shrink to perhaps one fifth of consumption from almost 100%. Now, let's go to this board because I want to show you so you can understand. This is on a monthly basis. 
any one of the Cuban population has granted through this system three or four weeks of basic consumption according to United Nations minimum level of calories ingestion in a month. To complete the four weeks basic level, it could come in the form of subsidized food on your workplace, lower prices, so you pay meals at subsidized prices. So that allows you to pay only weekends or nights meals. So there might be a week okay, that you might have to buy extra, purchase extra. It depends also on your consuming habits. Every aspect of Cuban life was affected by the special period, but no change was as far-reaching as agriculture. Cuba had committed to the Green Revolution, a system which requires the massive use of fossil fuels in the form of natural gas-based fertilizers, oil-based pesticides, and diesel fuel for tractors and other farm machinery. The country's agriculture was more industrialized than any other Latin American country and exceeded the U.S. in its use of fertilizer. The Cuban agricultural conventional green revolution system never was able to feed the people. It had high yields, but it was a lot oriented to the plantation agriculture, open economy. We export citrus, tobacco, sugar cane, and we import uh, the basic things, 55% uh, of the rice, more than 50% of the vegetable oil, of the oil and the lard that we consume. So the system, even in the good times, how people here remember, uh, never fulfill the basic needs. Cuba's agriculture began to falter as one problem after another halted production. Fuel and parts for tractors were almost impossible to find. Seeds, tools, animal feed, and vaccines were scarce. Esto trajo como consecuencia que, que la, 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 el de estar aquí era una, prácticamente una agricultura de supervivencia. Y los insumos que había de, de químicos ya no existían. Por ello que se dejó de la harina de trigo, los fertilizantes, los granos, el aceite. La, fue un golpe muy fuerte. Y muchas personas pensaban que el proceso podía colapsar en tres meses o seis meses. Y realmente fue una etapa muy difícil para readaptar la economía a las nuevas condiciones. The lack of fuel uh, drove us to have a very cho big shortage of food. So people they end up squatting places in the city and growing food there, without knowing how, because there were engineers, there were doctors, there was not farmers. A drastic effort to convert every piece of arable land to organic agriculture was begun. During the special period, Cuba was able to help prevent famine through an urban agricultural movement. Every vacant lot in the city was turned into orchard. At first, urban gardening was an ad hoc local survival response to the crisis. They, they needed food, they didn't know how, and they just did it, trial and error. And there was some space, they have a problem with garbage, dumping, rats, so they fix all of those problems, uh, get rid of the garbage and start growing things there. Another thing during the special period was this identification of idle plots of land, right, that were cleaned up by the community and turned into uh, agricultural gardens, urban agricultural gardens. Hearing of the crisis, Australian permaculture experts came to Cuba to assist in developing new ways to garden and raise food. So in October of 1993, the first two Australians came. And so we started to design the rooftop garden in that place. And after that, we got this uh, small project. For us, it was a lot of money, 26 America, thousand American dollars. And we started to do a train the trainer course. They're one of the largest capacity centers for permaculture in Havana. And they themselves have trained over 400 people. Not only have, through these workshops and courses, have, has the community learned about permaculture, but they here in the center have learned a lot about the community. For example, if someone comes here and they have a health problem, uh, what they, can, they do whatever they can to help with that, but also they serve as kind of a reference point. They will go 
and look for the specialist and bring them here so it's a mutual relationship. The people cooperating with and caring about each other are the main factors that we need to encourage. We can all plant fruit trees, we can all have water catchment devices on our roofs. It's not the technology, it's the human relationships. The neighbors are starting to see the possibilities of what they can do in their spaces and they're starting to create uh, uh, natural gardens on their roofs and also in their patios. Cubans, who formerly lived on the equivalent of just two dollars a month, found new ways to supplement their income. These grapevines have a lot of uses. It provides shade, so you have a little patio area. You also can make wine out of the grapes and, and it's very good for the family economy because if you do it well, you can get about 10 pesos for, um, for a bottle of wine. Cubans' view of agriculture has changed dramatically. Farmers are now among the highest paid workers and people from all fields are attracted to the profession. I'm a musician, mechanic, oh, mechanics. I'm a mechanics, automobile mechanics, uh, I'm a uh, designer, of the electronics, and nothing of this I am doing. Esto solo. Uh -huh. Only this. Only animals. Just animals and these plants. Yes. So he's an urban farmer on top of the, his house. The farmers in Cuba are not the poorest people in the society. On the contrary, they have food, so they don't have to spend their money on food, and they sell food, so they make good living. You know? So it is important to take that in account, that it's another way to dignify the people that grow food. With a very low cost, we were producing food, and now we have more than 1,000 kiosks allocated in the city that provide you with fresh fruits and vegetables produced in the neighborhood. More than 50% of the total vegetable needs of the Havana's population, 2.2 million inhabitants, is supplied by the urban agriculture. In small cities and towns, urban gardens are even more productive, providing 80 to 100 percent of the fruits and vegetables they need. Urban agriculture supplies food locally, eliminating much of the need for transporting food over long distances. The, the country has 169 municipalities. So five kilometers around the municipal towns also are considered urban agriculture. So it's a national system that is employing more than 140,000 people, actually. It's creating jobs. It's a growing sector of the economy. And it is very important. And we're very proud to say that. Cuba eliminated the need for natural gas-based fertilizers and oil-based pesticides by developing organic farming methods. Fortunately, research centers had begun studying sustainable agriculture before the crisis. Because of this preparation, the transition to an approach to farming that didn't depend on fossil fuels was implemented nationally within just a few years. Without fossil fuels, more manual labor was needed, making smaller farms necessary and increasing the number of farmers. One of the challenges, the peak oil challenges, is to reclaim land from the large-scale conventional agriculture. Un suelo en formar se tarda trata millones de años y en destruirse muy poco tiempo. Bueno, el problema, uno de los problemas que trae la tierra con con químico es la mineralización. Y la, y la desaparición de la microflora y la microfauna, de la vida del suelo. The soil is a, is a, is a living being. And in the top soil, in the first three inches of soil, is the key. You add chemicals, you damage all of that. So then the soils became almost like sand. So we're going to be having interesting challenges and to uh, rehabilitate the, the soil. Cuba found that it took from three to five years to make the land fertile and productive again. Organic needs a transition, no? needs some time and needs some money to establish the system because when you get the soil, the soil is so damaged. 